Hej och välkomna till årets första fåtölj här på FUF. Det är vi i seminariegruppen som anordnar de här seminarierna. Och dagens seminarie kommer att handla om Kinas involvering i Afrika. Och därför har vi bjudit in Henning Melbourne för att prata lite. Och dagens seminarium kommer att vara på engelska och hoppas att det är okej för alla. På slutet kommer det lämnas tid till lite frågor och reflektioner, så ni får gärna eh, fråga i slutet av eh, seminariet. Mm. Tack Anna och hej allihopa. Mm. Förlåt, min svenska är inte så bra. Jag måste prata engelska. Um, otherwise it would be a torture for you and for me. And uh, uh, the evening should be more on the fun side or at least relaxed and not torture. Um, I will speak freely. I have no PowerPoint and I think uh, this this nice environment invites for not having PowerPoint. So the arrangement is just up my alley. I like it very much. Uh, speaking freely has the risk that, of course, I will not present a uh, well-structured, detailed academic lecture. It's more along certain lines of argument, as announced, revisiting the issue which is discussed since at least 10 years now, uh, namely the emergence of China in Africa as a global actor who started mainly to act out on the African continent, uh, guided by certain interests, to have a look at that, to ask uh, to which extent this is more of the same or an alternative. And then actually I will try at the end to present an African perspective, but not a perspective of an African government, but more a perspective of African citizens who hardly ever feature prominently in the agenda of their governments, unfortunately, and what actually in terms of good governance the windows of opportunity could be to engage with uh, a new global player. But let me first start with a recent article published in the South African newspaper Daily Maverick which quotes, and that was this week, quotes the foreign minister of China, Wang Yi, during an Africa visit, where he said, I quote, in China's exchanges and cooperation with Africa, we want to see mutual benefit and win-win results. I want to make clear one point, that is China will never follow the track of Western colonists and all cooperation with Africa will never come at the expense of the ecology, environment or long-term interests of Africa. Sounds very nice. Mm -hmm. And most likely you and I have the same question the journalist had, namely, really? Mm -hmm. And then revisiting some of those based in South Africa who have experiences with China and engagement with China, uh, Chinese state-owned enterprises, um, the track record looks a bit more scattered. Uh, the environmental assessments have actually in most of the cases been poor, if not even non-existent which should not really come as a surprise given the last decades of Chinese industrial industrialization where the environmental assessments suffered from a similar uh, poverty. While China managed to lift uh, hundreds of millions of Chinese out of absolute poverty which had a huge statistical impact on the average aggregates in the world and uh, tends to uh, overlook that poverty in the African continent hardly has been reduced because the global statistics say, oh, hundreds of millions of people are elevated out of poverty. Meanwhile, it's mainly India and China. But in both countries, it came at the price of uh, industrial modernization, which actually did not respect at all environmental aspects. The degree of pollution in India and in China today is horrific and only now they gradually start to realize that it comes at a price. But in all their approaches, domestically as well as internationally, 
environmental assessment surveys or studies were definitely not a priority until now. Interesting enough, part of the response is says it starts to change with the increasing environmental awareness at home. Chinese companies realize they need to abide to certain minimum practices when it comes to environmental standards, maybe also somewhere else. But someone said they are not better until they prove otherwise compared with the West or any other external interests operating in African societies. But it's also interesting to see that there is dynamics in these relations. They change. China, whatever China means, I come to that later because there is not one homogeneous China operating in Africa, has applied different strategies adjusted and modified. The most recent example is that China has deployed 700 Chinese soldiers to act as peacekeepers in South Sudan. If someone would have predicted that 15 years ago, then most likely the answer would have been and the Pope is a black Muslim lesbian. <laughs> because it was a non-negotiable principle of China in the spirit and the pro programmatic uh, foreign policy of non-interference and not getting involved in any way in anything which even remotely smells of military undertakings. And that changed already when China participated in the fleet that was trying to protect uh, uh, the ship route along the Somali coast because it affected their major economic interests then already existing with the shipping route along the Indian Ocean to Southern Africa and along the Cape. And now we hear that there are 700 peacekeepers deployed to South Sudan, which, as I said before, would have been completely beyond imagination only 15 years ago. China is eager to say that this, of course, has nothing to do with its own interests. Now, knowing about who exploits the oil in South Sudan, the next question when reading that is, of course, again, really? Why then South Sudan? Which brings another adjustment in policies uh, looking at the last 15 years of Chinese uh, expansion into other parts of the world. The moment, and that's not only typical for China, the moment you manage as a foreign driven interest or agency to get a foot into the door of a society, your judgment of the situation changes. So at the turn of the century, China undertook huge risks by expanding into countries and war-torn regions where Western enterprises were reluctant to face the risk or pulled out, partly also because of pressure at home. Stud oil in the Sudan is a classical example. Stud Oil was one of the main players in the oil exploration in the Sudan. Then came the war-torn years and uh, pressure from the consumers in the Nordic countries saying if Stud Oil thinks it's good business to exploit the oil in the Sudan at the expense of the people there who are facing threats of genocide then we might decide to the next time fill our tank with petrol from some other petrol company. Not that they are much better. I mean, the options between Stud Oil and Shell and BP, <coughs> what's really the difference? But as a consumer in Western societies, you can use that as a very good strategic weapon. And at times it works. And those companies, afraid of losing their best customers, making a judgment and an account on balance reach the conclusion, at least we have to pull out to some extent and pretend we abide to the, prop, uh, to the principles expected, like no child labor involved. And we know that uh, it's a huge pressure on companies to adhere to those principles. At least they pretend.
and some of them still, as we know, even in Sweden, secretly try and think they get away with it, but when they are covered red-handed, they know it's not good for business. That's different in a player like China. There is no critical pressure from a critical consumer-oriented public. There is no civil society that comes out and puts political pressure on a government. There is an aspiring middle class and people elevated out of poverty who for the economic benefits they have through the Chinese industrialization very much identify even with that not very democratic government because they benefited from the economic progress. They are not asking any unpleasant questions what Chinese companies are doing elsewhere. And those Chinese companies, 15 years ago, with the backing of the governments, were able to move into regions and spaces where Western interests were reluctant. The Sudan was one example. Another very prominent example has been Zimbabwe by the early years of the 21st century when the sanctions came into the picture and it was China among others that repeatedly bailed out the Mugabe government. At times when it was so much under pressure that actually without support among others from China we might have another government these days in Zimbabwe. But the interesting thing is, comparing the times then with the times today, that once you manage to get a foot into the door, your assessment changes. Because all of a sudden you have an investment which is facing risks. So, while you made use of a window of opportunity under circumstances of instability where you were able to move in, where others were reluctant, the moment you are there, you are increasingly interested in growing stability. So 700 peacekeepers sent to the South Sudan is just a very striking evidence of that. Because the times are gone where Chinese companies would say the less security the better, because then we can move in back by our government and take the risks others won't take. They have done so, now they want to minimize the risks. The same happened in Zimbabwe, where on several occasions loans, which they had extended earlier on, they said to the Sanu PF government, it's time to pay back. Get your house in order. So these are some of the recent developments which are interesting to follow and which I come back. It was just, so to say, as a warming up uh, overview looking from the current situation back and then I will uh, revisit some other issues first. China is always considered to be the new kid on the block. At least that was the image it received, also, especially in the Western perception and the Western perception was pretty biased. And maybe I should now already make one thing very clear. As critical as an assessment might be when it comes to Chinese activities in African countries, the Western activities in African countries compare not better. So make no mistake, while I'm speaking about China in Africa and have a rather critical observation to share, that does not mean that if I would speak about Western interests in Africa, that the assessment would be more positive. And it's very interesting to note the double standards applied in the Western criticism of China in Africa, where people were at ease to cry foul and they said, it's a dismal lack of human rights and they close their eyes in front of corruption and they are searching for their own interests. And then when one recapitulated who is saying that on the basis of which track record, then it's just mind-boggling how the lack of memory comes into the picture. Of course, we deal with operations that are guided by economic and geostrategic interests. 
So why should China behave better than the West did? Let's just use one or two examples. Mobuto Seseseko, who governed his private empire in the Congo, then Sa'ir, for 30 plus years. And the West couldn't care less because it was a solid ally who accumulated on his private bank accounts more than the total debt of Sa'ir amounted to who was several times so much under siege that the regime only survived because of French and Belgian intervention. <coughs> and these are the countries who criticize the Chinese engagement in Africa. So while I'm not wasting a lot of time on that, I just want to make it clear for the record, don't mistake me. I will never ever say that the West is the better alternative. I will end with what I consider might be a better alternative due to new strategic maneuvering space because it's not any longer the West that dictates to countries in Africa what their options are. The times where Africa was the backyard of Europe, a standard term, came to an end with the end of the 20th century. And while until the late 1980s, African countries often had at least the alternative to opt for the one camp, meaning the Western camp, like Mobutu did, and in return got protection, or opt for the other side, the camp of the socialist bloc and got the protection there, like the oligarchy in Angola did, as a, an example, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, that bipolar world did not exist, at least for a decade. And it was the West, Fukuyama coined the, the, the um, famous phrase, the end of history, meaning the West has one, it's only capitalism, it was the West that for the 1990s could dictate basically all of the countries in the world what their trajectory ought to be if they qualify for good governance. Not by accident, the notion of good governance emerged in the 1990s. And those who had the power of definition were the Western countries who decided what good governance, good governance has to be. Now again, to, be, to complicate a little bit matters from a dialectical point of view, that while I present it so, that doesn't mean that good governance is crap. Of course, good governance can be very good, but it depends on the context in which you apply the term and how you define it. And there the power of definition very much comes into the picture. But with the new emerging global players, first and foremost China, but then the others now organized in BRICS. Uh, I leave aside South Africa, it's not really a global pair, it has more political um, reasons why they are generously added to the BRIC countries. But with Brazil, with Russia, with India and with China, the global playing field changed. And that was also testified by the Human Development Report of the UNDP of the second last one of 2013, which devoted a whole issue to the emerging global players. And it summarized the following, I quote a bit lengthy because I think it very much characterizes the global situation we are in today. So the Human Development Report diagnosed as follows. The South is now in a position to influence, even reshape, old models of development cooperation with augmented resources and homegrown lessons. But it also exerts new competitive pressures on other aspects of bilateral cooperation, resulting in greater opinions within the South for concessional finance, infrastructural investment and technology transfer. The growing assistance from the South is often without explicit conditions on economic policy or approaches to governance. 
The development emphasis on improved infrastructure, for example, has been rediscovered because of the domestic experience and lessons of some emerging economies. Putting it in slightly different language, while development cooperation of Western countries started from the 1970s, latest 1980s onward, to say we are not supporting the big infrastructural projects any longer. Small is beautiful, we invest in different things, we invest in governments, soft power, institution building. I'm not denying it makes sense, but they stopped the other things, which exactly now China comes up with. And it's a huge investor in building the dams the World Bank would never touch on for at times very good reasons. So again, I'm just taking stock. I'm not making a value judgment. Building airports, building railway uh, lines, uh, building harbors or, or improving them, building new roads, investing heavily in huge infrastructural projects, which Western development cooperation by and large has um, has avoided the last 20, 30 years. And there's a huge demand for that, especially in the days where the resources that are available and accessible in the continent are increasingly important to fuel the economies of the industrialized nations. But to get access and transport those resources, you need roads, you need railways, you need harbors, you need airports, and China builds them. Often with soft loans. China is one of the huge players now in the energy sector, in telecommunications and related to the infrastructural projects in the construction sector. But let me again quickly revisit the history because this all comes and the first reactions were, what a surprise, what are they doing? This is the new kid on the block. Well, not really. The Chinese presence was there latest since the Bandung conference in 1954. It was just not on the screen of the West that the Global South was in formation already since the 1950s. Decolonization had something to do with that. And ever since the Bandung conference and Mao's policy, who was heavily interested in support of the Global South as a strategic integral part of Chinese presence in the world and Chinese foreign policy, China was involved in a lot of societies on the continent. This is one of the other ironies. Chinese policy always is eager to stress that they have a policy of absolute non-intervention. But what do they mean? Because China was at the forefront of direct material support of the anti-colonial struggles on the continent. And they are praised for that. Well, is that not intervention too? It's just that you associate with intervention something else. It sounds so negative. But international solidarity is definitely a form of intervention. The volunteers going to the Spanish Civil War from the international left movement, that was a form of intervention. So we have to be careful what we mean with intervention. And when China says we never intervene in other countries, then it's simply not true. They did it all the time. And as I said, they are praised for that. Some of you might remember one of the biggest projects on the African continent in the early to mid-1970s, widely uh, dismissed and ridiculed by the West as the biggest elephant, white elephant, was the Tassara Railway. Everyone said, that's a joke. It will never, ever work. Well, from the perspective of African nationalists, it was the most prestigious project of the time on the continent. And who made it possible? China. And it had its ups and downs, most of the, of the time uh, downs. They were really facing huge problems, operational problems at huge costs. 
But let me tell you, Tassara Railway still works. 40 years later, China has just entered, I think, the 13th protocol, agreeing in continued support to upgrade the operations of Tassara, also called the Uhuru Railway, Freedom Railway. Now that signals something. So actually, since the 1960s, China had rather a comparative advantage over the West, maintaining a low key economically, but being there as a supporter of most African anti-colonial movements. Not that they always made the right assessment who to support. Interesting enough, it doesn't count any longer in the short memory of those who are now in government. China supported in Angola the UNITA at huge human costs. China, together with racist South Africa, supported UNITA, sending weapons there, guided by the anti-Soviet foreign policy of the 1970s. They are the best friends of the MPLA regime. China originally supported Swanu in Namibia. There are photos of the first uh, Swanu leaders uh, being photographed in Beijing together with Mao. Well, if you listen to the Swapo government today, then China is an all-weather friend. And so says China when uh, politicians visit Namibia. <coughs> The Swapo government is an all-weather friend. And you say, but how was the weather 40 years ago? That was very different. They've forgotten. Or maybe, really, it's of a secondary nature. Because at least China showed commitment to anti-colonial movements, even if at times to the wrong ones, the PAC in South Africa, not the ANC which is completely irrelevant today. But what is, what is more decisive is China put the money where its mouth was. It was against colonialism. It was against Western hegemony. So that makes it rather easy to come across more popular, at least in the eyes of the governments, compared with the Western countries. Now, that does not mean that China has completely different interests today on the continent. If you look at the statistics, then the language is exactly the same. The exchange relations between China and the African continent is export of raw materials and import of manufactured goods. It's basically identical with the exchange relations African societies, countries have with the rest outside of the continent. There's nothing different. It's not any alternative. Oh, I forgot to mention something else in the goodwill approach of China. If you visit African countries, almost it doesn't matter which one, and you ask the people, this soccer stadium, who built it? You stand the chance, nine out of the ten, that the answer is Chinese built it. And they started in the 1960s with it. They were much more sophisticated and clever in their strategy with Africa than the West ever has been. First of all, never a finger-wacking attitude. That's the message of the non-intervention. We don't tell you what to do. We look for mutual partnerships, but you have to decide what you're doing. We don't tell you. And identify those things where you can score big with little investment. If one thinks about it, football is the most popular sport with the exception of South Africa in the rest of the continent. Most likely in uh, South Africa, if it wouldn't have been apartheid, China would have come and offered to build a rugby stadium free of charge as a gesture of friendship, clever as they were. They really managed to cultivate 
a basis of mutual respect and of understanding, which the West never ever was willing to offer. There has always been this talk about partnership. In the meantime, there is a famous phrase, uh, partnership on the same eye level, and I'm always wondering what does it mean? Are they volunteering to get amputated from the knee to be on the same level? Uh, because it suggests something which doesn't exist in terms of the structural hierarchy. Well, if an African uh, head of government, and be it the worst dictator or despot, comes to China, he gets a red carpet. And the whole shebang is there. Everyone from the president to everyone and welcomes them. If African ministers go there, it's the same. If African ministers come to many of the Western countries, the best they get is maybe the level of a state secretary, because no one else thinks it's important enough to talk to them. These days, African students are able to study without hardly any limitations in the People's Republic of China. But even the most qualified, most reputable international scholars from Africa who only want to attend a conference in Western Europe for a week face the risk that they don't get a visa. Because the walls of Schengen get higher and higher and higher. And then to blame China because their cultural foreign policy um, kind of brings students in as a mean strategy is just forgetting that it's the flip side of a more and more fenced in Western Europe. Where else then in the emerging powers like Brazil or India or China should young African scholars go who might have the opportunity to get some additional higher education which the local universities could not offer? They don't manage to get to Umeo that easy any longer. Lund will have difficulties to take them. Yeah, maybe if they pay, um, what is it, in some of the Western universities, 20,000 euro a year, which means it's the 0.2% of the elite that can afford to send their kids to these universities. That's not how you build up a positive relationship. So, the Western discourse, coming back to that, on China in Africa, which dismisses all those things and has this negative connotation and says, ah, oh, that's very much hypocritical. What is also hypocritical is that it creates the misleading impression that China has, since years, taken over the dominance in the continent. Now, let me tell you, it hasn't. In terms of measurable, and that's a difficult category because China does not officially offer development aid. So it's somewhat difficult to measure what do they offer which would qualify as part of uh, ODI or development cooperation. But in one of the efforts that tried to take stock for 2012, China was ranking on number seven or eight in the list. It were all the Western countries plus Japan that already still made higher investments in terms of development cooperation on the continent. In terms of foreign direct investments, China came fourth or fifth. Where it is now number one, that is in terms of trade balance. But that's a different story. And half of the exports to China, 48% last year, were raw oil. Which brings me back to what I mentioned before, the exchange pattern is not different from the exchange pattern that African countries have with the rest of the world. More than 90% of the export to China is raw material where no value-added work has happened. So it's taken off the ground and shipped or flown 
to China on a huge scale. One of the ironies is that when the COP 14, I believe, climate change negotiations took place in Durban, I think two years ago, December two years ago, parallel a week before South Africa signed the biggest deal about coal mining with China. Imagine the irony, you host COP14, climate change negotiations, where you try to reduce CO2 emissions. And you know that coal as a fossil energy is one of the worst to continue with. And you sign the biggest deal on the world with China to ship coal from South Africa to China. That's part of our realities. Let me now, time is running, let me now deconstruct a little bit China. I'm making this sweeping statements to China. Now, China is as much non-homogeneous as the West. What, what does it mean? You have state-owned enterprises operating, and at the moment the estimate is it's something between 2,200 and 2,500 Chinese enterprises operating on the African continent. In basically every African country they are present. But again, if you remember, or not remember, but if you become aware that in South Africa under apartheid you most likely had as many Western companies operating illegally because it was good business, then it gives you a proportion. 2,200 different Chinese operations in the whole of the African continent sounds big. It's not. It's not big at all. Western companies operating in the continent are multiple times as much. I mentioned some of the uh, areas in which they are, and it's state-owned enterprises, but it's also increasingly private enterprises. And there's a growing number, and that's the most critical one, of individuals. There are tens of thousands, well, I must say on the continent in the meantime, certainly hundreds of thousands, if not even more, of individual Chinese who make use of the new individual liberties, some of them on an assignment in a country and then decide to stay there or take the private risk and go to the countries. And that might be something which is new compared with the West. That you have individuals who go there to seek their luck because it's difficult to survive in their home country. So it's basically the Swedes of the 19th century, if you allow me that analogy, who had nothing to lose and went for the hopefully greener pastures abroad in North America and elsewhere. The Chinese move to African countries in the hope to make a better living. And they do it as straight as on small scale, that's how very often they start. And I was confronted with a very revealing experience when I attended the World Social Forum in Nairobi in January 2007. Now, first of all, it took place in a, a football stadium at the margins of Nairobi. And guess who had built it in the 1960s? Yeah. It was in a dilapidated condition, so they are not the better constructors than the Western countries, companies, if that is of any comfort for Western construction companies. Uh, but it was a Chinese gift. The World Social Forum took place in that stadium, and that was part of the new Go South strategy of China, that they sent an NGO delegation to the World Social Forum. Now, who knows? anything about China gets very suspicious when he hears there is an NGO delegation coming from China. There is actually nothing like an NGO in China today, as much as a civil society. The little civil society that is there is imprisoned or facing repression. So the few NGOs operating are state-run NGOs. 
and you had this NGO and they put up fancy posters completely different from anything else the social movements did to communicate in that environment and context in Nairobi at the World Social Forum. And they announced we will have a big meeting about the Chinese uh, friendship and solidarity with the African people. And those who come will get a gift. Just imagine the language in radical, at times militant social movements and you see a poster, a glossy poster, promising if you come and attend the debate you will get a gift. So it was the complete mismatch. But more interesting than that, which showed how much out of touch the Chinese policy, at least then, it has slightly changed, there is a learning curve, was with the realities on the ground, was actually the experience those poor NGO people, so-called NGO people made. They distributed brochures, there were glossy magazines, and they sh showed the Chinese friendship with the African people. And it showed Chinese heads of state shaking hands with Mugabe, with the head of state of the Sudan, with the head of state of Gabon, with the head of the state of uh, Guinea. And then you could wait for the social movement activists to say, what kind of friendship are you documenting? It's not a friendship with the African people. It's a friendship with dictators and despots who repress, oppress and prosecute the people who are in demand of human rights, of justice, of more material well-being. And then they went a step further and said, you are worse than Western imperialism because your people come and compete on the ground with our local hawkers who find it difficult to make a living. And now we have Chinese traders competing with them where the West would never ever have been physically present. You take away the little those people have in their battle for survival. You destroy the textile manufacturing in West Africa with your cheap imports. You undercut even this, the low prices of the local traders with your cheap imported um, second-rate manufactured goods from China. So it was very interesting to see this cultural shock basically on the ground where it dawned on them, well, the Chinese-African friendship does not really relate to what the activists in the world social movement have to say. I see that my time is running out and I haven't uh, really covered only half of what I wanted to say, but we have time uh, to discuss. I want to come to a point which I find very important that is the, and relates to that. That is the Africanist perspective. Because if it is so that actually the Chinese engagement in African countries resembles features of an elite pact where the friendship is a friendship between heads of state. What then would be the alternative? And as the lengthy quote from the UNDP actually suggested, and I fully agree, there might be other chances because in contrast to the 1990s, there's new maneuvering space. African countries have options. There are more competitors. The old competitors on the continent remain as interested in the natural resources of the continent as they were before. Only that they have to compete with new, rather aggressive competitors and that might provide room for negotiations. So imagine for a moment you would have a government and higher bureaucrats in the public administration 
who do not define deals over natural resources only in the perspective what is in it for me. But imagine for a moment you would have uh, administration and politicians which would resemble faintly features of what you would find 50 to 100 years ago in Sweden or some other Western countries, Denmark, where a civil service and politicians not only said but really believed that they are acting in the public interests and did not define the public interests as exclusively their individual private interests. Where they would say in African governments today, if you're interested in our resources, make us offers, put them on the table and tell us how you want to comply with a list of criteria we are sharing with everyone interested. And these criteria could be, I make them up, could be you put open the books, you involve at least half of the operations through local capital and staff, you use part of the investment to train people also for the upper levels of the work. You do value added work with the resources. You do not export them as the copper you bring out. You do not export the raw oil. You invest in a refining. Now, that's a stupid example because I think oil should stay in the ground. But <laughs> since this is not the reality, I need to share it with you. Don't think I'm promoting that. But the point is to say, you're not just shipping away what we have and there's nothing left at the end. In the process of exploiting our natural resources, you leave behind first an infant industry, which then is built on further, a qualified workforce, you pay taxes, you don't cheat the local tax offices through transfer pricing, which is organized crime of the biggest. You must imagine that countries like Zambia, they see nothing from the profits that are done on copper because of what is called transfer pricing, where the local mining companies buy at outrageous overpriced rates equipment they need from their own subsidiaries to then say, well, we didn't make really any meaningful profit. Of course they did. It's organized crime of the biggest dimension you can imagine. It at times turns mafia into a kindergarten if you look what financial capital and uh, those oil companies and others are doing. And if then under these circumstances you put your business plan and then we compare. We compare it with each and every other bidder and the one who makes the best offer in terms of these criteria will be in it for the deal. And one would even be able to add if then 0.5% and still in the pockets of those who represent the country interests, I think the ordinary people wouldn't really mind because a lot would still remain in the country for the benefit of the local population. What we have now, however, is a race to the bottom where China and others just add to this race without providing any meaningful, sustainable alternatives. Which brings back the question, so how to change it? And that brings in the picture again, 
social forces like those who gathered in Nairobi for the World Social Forum. It would be the organized workers, it would be the grassroots people who feel betrayed by their own governments because their government's only interest is to make the best businesses in their own interest. Which also means changing business partners. Angola brought in China for the oil exploration when the Western oil mineral companies were under pressure to adhere to the transparency index. Then when China was into the business, the Western companies tried to make even better options and when the Chinese investments had reached a degree where China felt they can tell the Angolan oligarchy what they would do, they entered new businesses with Western oil companies. So they are not stupid when it comes to the pursuance of their own interests. So what is needed is a stronger support from those who are cheated all the time in those societies. And there is a dimension, and maybe I can end with that because it relates to us sitting here, there is a dimension that brings back the notion of international solidarity. Because if you have these people desperately fighting for more decent living conditions, and putting the demands to the governments who fail to provide good governance, even if they might qualify according to the criteria of Western partners. They should be aware and should know that there are international allies in that fight. And as I mentioned in passing, you don't have those allies in China. The solidarity defined there is a different one. It's a pact among elites. But I feel pretty confident and sure when I talk to you sitting here that most, if not all, of you resemble that feature of international solidarity. Otherwise, you wouldn't come to FUF and listen to such a subject. Some of you are old enough that I know you were engaged in the anti-apartheid struggles. You were mobilizing to support the national anti-colonial liberation movements. Some of you are of another age. You will look into attack or, or World Social Forum rings a bell. But all of you in different ways can relate to a notion of international solidarity. And mind you, those who fight for a decent living in those countries are aware what it means to have solidarity. So, you are the ones who can also contribute by enhancing pressure on the governments in their own countries to adhere to certain minimum standards. And if these governments, doesn't necessarily have to be Sweden, but others, are tempted to take the cheap way out by putting the finger on others and say, what are they doing? Then it's for those to remind them, well, what are you doing? So that at the end, a critical assessment of the role of China or any other player in African countries and their effects should actually be a reminder and bring us back and what are our governments and what are our companies doing? Are they any better? And if not, is it then for us to criticize China in Africa? Or should we rather start by criticizing those at home? I think my time is up. Have any questions? Any questions? Hello? Yeah. Yeah.
I would like to ask you about uh, agriculture projects. Mm -hmm. They are of a slightly different nature, aren't they? Um, does China engage in uh, helping the population, or do they outcompete mm. the population? And who is uh, profiting from their involvement? Should I answer directly? Yes. That question illustrates the dilemma. If you have 40 minutes to talk about China and Africa, you talk about one-fifth of what you want to say or should say. I didn't even mention the land issue. Mention the land issue. It's, of course, one of the crucial issues. But I'm afraid there is not really a straightforward answer because even the Chinese operate, even if it's China's operations, very differently in different countries. So there are better practices and there are worse practices, like most likely with other agencies from the West as well. And again, there is a lot of mystification around it. Um, yes, they are involved in land grabbing, as many other countries are, and there are interesting other players. The, the, the oil emirates are one of the biggest land grabbers in, on the African continent. They are never ever feature otherwise prominently. But um, food security is one of the top priorities in the 21st century, and uh, they are competing. China is one of them. Um, but to give you one example, there were rumors that they have basically purchased one third of Mozambique. And there are, I don't know how many, tens of thousands of Chinese that were shipped there to, to be their own tillers. There was not any credible evidence for that, even if everyone talked about that. It was talk of the town and in Mozambique they went traumatized, oh, now the Chinese take us over. There is not really any credible evidence of that. So it also is, has to do with having not reliable information on some of the things, which then feeds into huge amounts of speculation. Um, what we know or what we believe to know from Ethiopia, it's not a good track record. It's another case where I think Chinese land grab does not feature as a very positive example. And then one can say, but where would land grab feature as a positive example in any case? So if the bottom line is that land grab, if you mean it in the, in the strict sense of the term, um, then land grab by definition is nothing positive. But I'm tempted to say they are not really worse than other land grabbers from wherever they come. Um, that's, I'm sorry, that's the only answer I can give. But land grab is an important issue. Um, just since I said this uncertainty uh, fuel speculations. Um, for example, one of the very prominent um, uh, mystifications is that the Chinese bring in prisoners for labor in the mines and elsewhere. And they are then let free and they are basically unleashed on the African societies. There's no established fact on that. What fuels into those suspicions is that the Chinese, when they are present, physically present in the countries, stay outside of the societies. They normally are in compounds, like in the Copper Belt, where there is a huge presence of Chinese miners. They completely stay out of uh, the society, and that has again to do with the original fundamental principles of Chinese engagement with other societies. You are not supposed to be a burden. And they define it in a way you stay out of the society, even to the extent you even import the basic foodstuff and bring it along from China. Which causes sentiments and resentments on behalf of the local population, which the Chinese were not aware of. There were these stories where the Chinese are accused, you don't even buy in our local shops, you think you are better. And then it turns out that they were shocked and said, but we didn't want to be a burden. So it's a classical miscommunication with different cultures that clash. And building up this kind of secret cloak, this secrecy, fuels, of course, into all these speculations. I know in Namibia, for example, where there is a visible Chinese presence, but no one knows how many. You get numbers where you say, what? I mean, how can that be? 
Then on the other side, you hear stories now when, when there's Christmas time, then half of the planes leaving Windhoek, uh, half of them, uh, of the passengers are Chinese who fly home. And then you say, if each plane flying to Johannesburg is half full with Chinese passengers, <laughs> then there seem to be an awful lot of Chinese in the country. But it's all these things where you never really know what it is, this cloud. And with the land grabs it's very difficult because most of these deals are also made clandestinely. Governments are not really releasing openly what deals there are when they give away land and what they get in return and what part of the deal is. So the local population is left wondering and guessing and normally if you are left wondering and guessing you're not assuming the best, you are assuming the worst. Thank you very, very, very much. Um, as you, uh, you ended by uh, uh, underlining the importance of uh, civil society and our uh, solidarity with the uh, citizens and, and, and the poor and so on in, in Africa, also in this uh, relations, China-Africa. But another... Uh, um, agent here is of course the the African governments and uh, again I, I know the, the the impossibility to cover everything but I would be very interested in hearing your uh, comments or, or assessment of which of the African governments have been most successful in, so to mm. say, handling the Chinese and getting mm. more out of this uh, win-win uh, rhetoric mm. also in practice. Thank you. Can't you ask me easier questions? <laughs> yes, I can. It's, there is not really a government that strikes me to say that's, that's a great experience. It's more the, the, the worst cases that come to your mind. And I think that lies to a large extent in the rent-seeking nature of African governments. And I touched that the way I described it, uh, that basically they're interested to get a maximum out of giving away licenses or to... They are different. There are differences. And it was interesting to see what happened in Zambia. Uh, which also was one of the cases that illustrated that the Chinese declared policy of non-intervention was just uh, made up. Because some of you might remember there was this um, aggressive trade unionist called the Crocodile, Michael Sata. The Crocodile because of his nature and his aggressiveness. As a trade unionist, uh, when he started to compete for the presidency, he campaigned anti-Chinese mainly based on the experiences in the Copper Belt. And in the Zambian Copper Belt there were some gruesome violent acts against Chinese because of the horrible con working conditions the miners were, the local miners were exposed to. You have similar stories from elsewhere where one is tempted to say that working conditions under some, not all, under some Chinese companies are worse than they were under Western companies. But Sata, in the first round when he was uh, um, a serious contender, didn't make it. But while he had this election campaign, um, the Chinese got worried because he used the anti-Chinese sentiment for his election campaign. And they went to Lusaka and said, um, if Sata is elected president, we have to stop our support to some of our development projects so much about the policy of non-intervention. But the next time round, Sata became the president and he toned down a little bit his anti-Chinese sentiments because originally he said, I throw them all out, all. He didn't throw out a single Chinese once he was president. But I think they also managed to negotiate at least several limited reforms when it came to mining enterprises in the Copper Belt. So that would be an example to say, well, in policy processes it very much depends on the degree of engagement and of course there is room for negotiations. It's, there's always room for negotiations. 
The question is, why is it not used? Because it's so convenient. I'm sure the Angolan oligarchy would have tremendous room of negotiations. All they negotiate is even more profits for themselves. If that is the only room for negotiations you use, then it's difficult to come up with best practices. And that is the temptation. It's interesting, and I'm not having a good answer, it's more a question to look closer into how the South African government handles the engagement with China, because there are several sides to it. Um, South Africa is in a process of rapid deindustrialization, which is really worrisome. And that's partly a contributing factor to the Chinese engagement. The textile sector in South Africa, which was quite important, it's completely destroyed. But on the other hand, Chinese textile uh, entrepreneurs have outsourced, uh, uh, South African entrepreneurs, have outsourced to China. Now that's a very interesting business model that you say those textile companies who couldn't compete with the Chinese, they now go to China, they fabricate there and bring it back and sell it as South African products in South Africa to keep at least a limited amount of workers employed instead of closing shops completely. Not sure if that's the best solution, but it shows some degree of um, creativity to deal with the situation. I've heard that similar experiences can be made in Ghana with the textile industry, where the government came up with some ideas how to regulate the cheap import of uh, Chinese fabrics to the local market and come up with a situation where Ghanese people involved in the textile industry, which is a huge sector there in West Africa, are participating in the businesses. So. The challenge is how do you get something out of it which is not only pocketed by the, by the governments. That's the tricky thing why I ended with that, um, to find these governments. It would be interesting and I have no information how the government in Botswana would deal and how big the Chinese influence there is. I, I really don't know. That would be an interesting case. Mauritius would be an interesting case to see how do they negotiate. Are these societies where the Chinese have a huge interest? Or are they guided in their interests by those countries where the rogue states provide the best climate? Uh, because there you can do the business following your own taste and you just uh, take on board the local corrupt elite and that's it. So that, that would be maybe, an, if there is a survey, I don't know it. Otherwise, it might be a good survey to make where is the biggest uh, interest and uh, investment of Chinese in the, and is there any correlation between the degree of, uh, of uh, good governance represented by the, by the governments? Um, by all standards, Namibia ranks among the top six when it comes to good governance on the continent, but I'm, I'm sorry to say when it comes to the economic government governance, it's pretty much of a mismatch. Uh, they score big in terms of politics and human rights, but not in terms of economic management in the sense of uh, um, trying to negotiate the best for the local economy. And maybe I should mention in that context another thing. What is missing in almost all of the countries is what was termed once a patriotic bourgeoisie. You never ever since decolonization or before had in African societies a meaningful segment of local capitalists. In the sense of business people who would invest in productive sectors of the economy, of course with the interest to make profits, but through creating employment opportunities, maybe building up infant industries, manufacturing, and using part of the, pro uh, of the profit to reinvest, of course again with the aim to make more profit, but a patriotic bourgeoisie in the sense that they accumulate capital with the intention to reinvest in their own country. Not even in South Africa that happens. What happens in all the countries is a net export of capital every year. They generate profits through a resource extraction, 
don't use it to invest it in an industry, but transfer it on bank accounts on the Cayman Islands or somewhere else or for the stock exchange. And that's it. And at the end of the day, the natural wealth is gone and nothing else has been created. It might be different if there would have been a meaningful degree at least a tiny degree of a patriotic bourgeoisie which would negotiate in that interest that we want to keep something. We want to add value to the copper before it's exported. We want to, uh, to use our natural resources for different purposes. We are not exporting the agricultural products as they are. We built up uh, a food industry. We process uh, the fish instead of just exporting it as it is. That kind of things where many of the African countries have a natural wealth, but they never add value to the natural wealth before it's exported. And there, uh, so to say, the missing link is the patriotic bourgeoisie, which then would influence, of course, the governments and would lobby and say, hey, Thank you for an interesting review, Henning. I really enjoyed that. Um, first, to comment on the uh, how uh, Chinese behave, to which countries do they actually go? When uh, we have looked at the mining sector, we see that it's. You, I, I haven't got the answer to the question you posed, but in countries where the there is some uh, a ve uh, uh, possibility or and some uh, more developed uh, governance structures like in South Africa the Chinese investors behave slightly different mm. so it's 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 as you said very correctly you know you can't talk about China as as one mm. but what you I think you can say is that that if they are Chinese investors are controlled, they are normally behaving better than if they're not. Mm. So that was just a little observation here. What I wanted to to ask you about is uh, perhaps not directly related to to China, but uh, you several times came and referred to the demand need for added value, and and of course I agree in in theory. But uh, as you know, uh, we have a long engagement in Namibia and we recently did a study for the government on the value addition of minerals. And most of the ideas that government came up with would have been value destruction rather than value addition. Uh, so I, I find I would like to have a few comments from you on that because it's, yes, wonderful to produce galvanized steel you have iron ore in Namibia, you have zinc mines, but the demand for, for galvanized steel and, and the, the production factors, you know, who shall invest, etc., etc. So that's my first question. The other is that, that I think that you're underplaying a bit the importance of four African countries to use the competitive situation between the Chinese and and other investors, be they from traditional mining companies or for that matter Brazil or India and at least I mean the Commission of the African Union, they have used that as a, as a prime uh, possibility in, in their strategy for uh, developing of, of mm -hmm. the mining sector. So why are you so negative about the possibilities there? Thank you. Well, the second one is, seems to be a misunderstanding. I actually try to emphasize that is the window of opportunity. Okay. And they should utilize it much more. So it, is, it creates new options. It's only that they are not using them. So I think I, maybe I was not clear enough or did the others understand that I tried to say that. It is a window of opportunity. You should actually make much more out of it than the governments do. They fail to use that, that opportunity. Um, when it comes to the value adding strategy, then you did the study. You should tell me what, what yeah, I'm very interested to learn more. But of course, you need to make very informed strategic decisions. Uh, 
I mean, to invest in a sugar, and that was in Namibia in the 90s, to invest in a huge sugar plant plantation in, in the north of Namibia, while there is already a complete overproduction of sugar in the whole Sadek region. That is burning money. It's not value-adding money. So you used uh, the, the galvanized steel. If there is no market for galvanized steel and you produce it and then you add horrendous costs for transport, then that is not obviously a value. Then you don't do the prop proper accounting what is a value added strategy. You need, of course, first to assess where is there a chance for, let's call it a niche economy, where if you add locally a value, the transport routes and the markets in the vicinity would pay out for the investment. If that is not the case, then most likely you would have to negotiate other things. In Namibia, the proposal was two or three years ago to add a tax to the export of unrefined natural resources. And then the lobby groups for the mining industry were shouting foul. They said, no one will invest any longer in the Namibian mining industry. Meanwhile, the discussion was, do you add, I don't know what it was, 3% or 5% on what you want to export? And of course, you continue to make profit. Why would mining companies not want to invest any longer, even if the profit margin is reduced by 3%. So that a government then says, oh, I'm sorry, um, of course we want investment, so we scrap the tax completely. That is this example where you start wondering, well, what have they got in return from the lobby groups that they are not imposing the tax? Because I think it's a complete fairy tale to imagine that mining companies would not be any longer interested in the operations. They are interested as long as there is a business. If the uranium uh, prices go down, they might not be interested. But it has nothing to do with the tax. It has to do with the world market prices of the things. When copper skyrockets, they come in whatever costs because they, they think there is huge business to make. At the moment, the latest news in Namibia is that um, the, 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 the oil price is uh, hitting rock bottom. Um, it's very bad because they made quite some business, at least individuals, by selling exploration licenses for oil off the coast. That's not a priority on the agenda of mining companies because these are huge investments. You know much better than me, but they are huge investments. If you get for a barrel less than 100 US dollars or even less, you're not making these huge investments now. You wait for other times because you also not make that much profit that you can risk those investments. So, but these are other factors. And I think the good governance factors would only if at all in a secondary degree impact on the way to make business, but they would benefit hugely the social interest. And that's where this opportunity comes in. While you still have competing interests uh, who want to have access to the resources, you could negotiate much better deals. I'm really convinced you could. Yeah, we have one small question from the audience. Uh, we want to know more about you and where do you work is one question. Mm -hmm. Do I have to use that microphone? Uh, yes. Oh, maybe you can use your own, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's your where question. You, no, we wonder where you work. Oh, so, you sorry. Work. <laughs> <laughs> because you seem like okay, so Yeah, he is very... Well, I have, uh, I've known Henning since... Uh, 1980. Yeah, early. Was it 80 exactly? Okay. When you had the first uh, issue of the raw materials report. Yes, right, that's right. So uh, I'm a, a mineral economist at present, but I'm, uh, I am uh, 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 has a I have a, an NGO background. So I started a, 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 a study group. It was called in those days. In, there was a publication uh, which some of you might remember, Commentar. And, and that has developed into an, an, a, a more of a consultancy business. And, and uh, we have been advising governments in Africa and the Commission of the African mm -hmm. Union uh, and, and for the past 20 years, 30 years, from the mid-80s, mm -hmm. basically. And, and so in Namibia, 
uh, we did some work together when Henning was in Namibia. I was working for government there. You so a long background. You are very modest in your... You're very modest. I would say. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I think that's suitable. <laughs> <laughs> And the raw materials group always uh, was on the right side, meaning not the political right. So even when working with governments, it was what is the best interest for the people, not for the governments. So and maybe I can say that if he doesn't say that. About this value addition. Yes. And that's a mantra in South yeah. Africa and Namibia. And, and I think uh, value addition, the tax is a good idea, but basically the that's not the goal. The, mm. the goal is to create value addition, and you cannot do that in, in by uh, saying that you have to pay a little extra tax. None of the proposals mm. that government yeah. came up with was yeah. reliable. Well. <laughs> I should stress, I didn't want to create the impression it's an easy way out. No. It's easy set, but to find a good sustainable strategy is far more difficult than it sounds. It's not that easy. To have natural resources is not the solution to everything. The way how you best handle them. Uh, in terms of sustainability, in creating uh, wealth for the ordinary people is very difficult. So it sounds so easy when I say it, but I didn't want to create that impression that it's easy peasy and they just don't get it how to do it and I would do it single-handedly if I would go into government tomorrow. But I think when you speak, Henning, about the solidarity with Sweden, it is very interesting to understand that we have the same situation. We, have, uh, we Sweden, has built a, a, a sustainable uh, uh, economy based on mining, and, and it's like the, there are some certain aspects of mining which I think are underestimated, and one is that like you just spoke about the destruction of the Mauritian textile industry, but the Botswana and the Namibian mines, they remain in Namibia and Botswana, they cannot be moved. And there is too much emphasis on, on the non-renewable aspects. Mm. The mines in Kiruna, for example, they've been in operation in more than 100 years, and, and there are a long... Uh, uh, many years ahead. So, uh, what is sustainability if you cannot, if, if to stay and operate an industry for a hundred years in the same place? Mm. And I'm sure Tsumeb will be mm. reopened. And mm. it is resources are has nothing to do with geology. Mm. It has all to do with economy. And and when prices go up, you can continue. Mm. Sorry to, to no. interact so much. I, think I get excited here. <laughs> I think that was the last question because we don't have that much time. So I Can I quickly add then sure? something? Yeah. Because Magnus mentions an interesting example, that's the diamond industry in Namibia, which is not identical as far as I, I know too little about Botswana to really say that, he knows more. But it's interesting again, how is it used? And you have now a playing with words in Namibia between rights holders and site holders. And that touches on predatory capitalism of a local parasitic elite. Because the involvement on the Namibian side in the generation of the wealth in the diamond industry can be used for very different purposes. You can generate profit which you then reinvest in the industry or you, re or you invest it in education or in the improvement of health services or of training of uh, miners or other stuff. Nothing wrong. Or you can privatize it among the few stakeholders who nominally are representing the government interest in these operations. And just recently there was a deal made with uh, NAMDEP, which is uh, um, half of it De Beers, that um, 
I, I repeat what I read through an investigative journalist, so I'm, I'm not the one who generated the knowledge. Maybe it's wrong, but that article published was never refuted, which is of course interesting if no one says this is made up. That the deal is that part of the diamond production of a year is released for local diamond polishing. But the local diamond polishing is controlled by less than 10 people who come from the Swapo party in government. And they privatize the enormous profits we are talking about. And that brings me back to that example I, I ended with. Just imagine for a moment, this handful of people would get 3% and they would still be richer than they could spend the money and 97% of that money would end up in a public pool and is used for increasing health services, invested in primary education, uh, in empowering more or train more the workers in the diamond polishing factories, whatever. I mean, I make. Just imagine for a moment that this wealth, this mass of wealth which is there and which is spent on the latest luxury cars. You have people driving Maseratis in Namibia. Now, if you know the conditions of Namibian roads and then you hear someone drives a Maserati, um, it's the biggest mismatch you can imagine. Um, they spent wealth of money for shopping sprees to Doha or wherever, Dubai, um, golden bracelets, uh, whatever. It's all money spent on consumer items, luxury items, in a country which has the highest income disparities in the world. It has the highest Gini coefficient of all countries. It's the most unequal country in the world, but has on average, an average that doesn't exist, uh, exist a per capita income of 6,000 US dollars per person a year, which is a middle income country. What could you do with that money generated if it would be used differently? And don't blame the Chinese for that. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. That's very sweet.